My work uh, looks at naloxone access and its influences on opioid use behaviors. So I'm going to present a part of this, uh, which is actually part of my dissertation work here at the university. So Dr. Burstein gave us a wonderful overview of the epidemiology of opioid use and opioid overdose. And these are just a few local headlines. If I had been working on my presentation last night, I would have included the press conference with the seven overdoses in the past 24 hours. But just a reminder to consider that we are one of the states that has seen a year-over-year -year increase, a significant increase in opioid overdose deaths. And you can see us right there in that kind of blue box. But more importantly, this has been a national trend, again, as Dr. Burstein uh, showed us in her slides. And you can see that final bar for 2015, that's that 33,091 deaths from opioid overdose. And with these increasing trends, there's those of us in public health that are trying to figure out what do we do. And one of those solutions is naloxone or Narcan. And so this is a drug that's overwhelmingly safe and effective. It's an opioid antagonist that reverses the respiratory depression of opioid overdose. And it's been shown to be, um, again, very safe, well tolerated uh, in a variety of populations. And it can be given intravenously, intramuscularly, or most recently, intranasally, and that was approved in November 2015 by the FDA, in part because of the overdose crisis. And so throughout the presentation, you'll see some different ways to administer naloxone or Narcan. This is the intranasal version. And I actually had two people prior to the presentation today say, I have my Narcan kit if you want to use it in your presentation. So good on you. And uh, hopefully there's some more of you in the audience who have your naloxone kit as well on naloxone access. And because of this overdose, we've been broadening access to naloxone. What was originally available only in hospitals or by emergency services personnel, like ambulances, is now widely available. So here in Erie County, police and fire carry naloxone, as well as community uh, lay people, non-medical providers who have an interest uh, in saving a life when they're able to, as well as users themselves. And this is really because the ideal responder is the person who arrives there first. Naloxone or Narcan administration is time dependent. You want to get that drug to the person as soon as they start to overdose in the hopes that you reverse the respiratory depression and you save that individual's life. So there are a number of these programs, opioid education and naloxone distribution programs nationwide. And like I said, they target a variety of stakeholders in this epidemic. Here's a uh, map of the United States, and you can see all but five areas are yellow, and those are the regions in the country that have some level of naloxone access law. So whether those are Good Samaritan laws or reducing civil criminal liability, it varies by state, but it's something that is widely, widely acknowledged. And so now that leaves us with these, these questions. So we know that there are increasing overdose deaths. We know that naloxone access is increasing, but colleagues and I have been talking a little bit about this, and we've been thinking through what are the effects on the opioid users themselves. And so we were talking, there's some anecdotal reports of um, like the comments made earlier about people calling, saying, I'm going to overdose, come check on me. What's going on there? So I looked at the literature and, and couldn't really find anything. So that's where this work fits in. So the study objectives were to look at how social networks influence naloxone access, attitudes, and knowledge, and then whether or how that knowledge shapes opioid use and overdose. So I developed a small pilot study to look at this using semi-structured one-on-one interviews. And so we worked with 20 patients at the Stutzman Addiction Treatment Center it's the only New York State-sponsored addiction treatment center for the eight counties of western New York. Many of you are probably familiar with it. Uh, for those of you who aren't, it's kind of near the Elmwood Village area. And we uh, talked with adults 18 to 40 who were in treatment for opioid use. So it could either be illicit uh, opioid use or non-medical use of prescription drugs. We did uh, receive UB, IRB approval, and participants were thanked for their time with a $10 grocery store gift card. So our interview guide uh, took two kind of broad themes that we wanted to look at. First was naloxone knowledge, access, and attitude. So we asked them questions like, what do you know about naloxone? 
Have you ever had your own naloxone kit? And why do you or do you not have a kit, depending on their answer to the previous question? Our second main topic was looking at naloxone and opioid use and overdose. So this included questions like, can you tell me a little bit about how you've used opioids in the past? What about an overdose? Is this something you've experienced? And is naloxone something you've thought about having around while using? And then at the conclusion of the interview, we did ask participants if there was anything else that they would like to share. So the interviews were audio recorded and then transcribed. We also gave participants a brief demographics booklet just to get some background you know, demographics, some substance use information, number of overdoses, things along that line. We, that data was dual data entered with REDCap, uh, a NIH-sponsored uh, data capture tool. And then we did thematic content analysis using Atlas TI. So our results. This is where I think things get really exciting. So this is just a word cloud of my codes. The bigger the word, the more frequent the code was used. And then it's color coded just because I, I guess I can't help myself. But you know, all the access codes were light green, for example. And, and um, it gives you a little snapshot of what we're going to talk about. So our participants were in that same age range that Dr. Burstein was talking about, those late 20s. Uh, average age was 28 years old, 40% female, 60% male. And you'll see that the majority of them were single. In addition, you'll notice that 85% had experienced at least one overdose. Many of our participants experienced more than one overdose, but at least 85% had experienced an overdose. Through our content analysis, we, came, we developed five major themes. Awareness about naloxone, how naloxone intersects with drug selling, naloxone availability while using, changes in opioid use behaviors, and then how naloxone behaviors and overdose mortality risk might interact. So our first theme really focused on the knowledge and content uh, for naloxone. So what do participants know about naloxone? Where did they get this information? And so overall, 90% of our participants were aware of naloxone. However, only 45% had ever had their own naloxone kit. So though the awareness was very high, relatively fewer participants had ever had their own kit. Of those 45% who had a kit, most of them had gotten it from either the local needle exchange downtown or from methadone maintenance treatment programs, so outpatient substance use treatment. Those who have used a kit, about 35% had used a kit on someone else, but you'll note that means that the majority have not used a kit on someone else. In addition, uh, participants, 55%, just over half of our participants, had naloxone used on them. And of those individuals, the majority of participants were revived via EMS or police or fire. So it wasn't a fellow substance user who, uh, who were um, reviving them. It was kind of through the system, through fire, police, et cetera. So our second theme looked at how naloxone intersects with drug selling. So I had participants talk about how they end up selling drugs in order to fund their substance use habit. And they termed this survival selling. And this is something that came up frequently for participants. And it's nicely summarized by this quote. So naloxone changes my mind about selling heroin. Just the survival selling, which I've done before, it's definitely changed my mind about that. Because if he can get, get a charge, any of us can. And so this participant was talking about a specific dealer who had recently in the news been uh, charged with a homicide. And this concern motivated her to make sure she had naloxone in case someone were to overdose while she was selling them the heroin. So then our third theme looked at naloxone availability while using. And so this really gets into attitudes, feelings about naloxone, how participants described why they'd have it, why they wouldn't. Some participants said there was no need to have naloxone available while using. Others felt it was a good thing to have, but they didn't necessarily go out of their way to make sure they had it. And finally, there were a few participants who talked about having naloxone every time they used. They were adamant about it. One of them told me it was as important as a clean needle. So this participant represents that first view. And he stated that we didn't care about hurting ourselves. We didn't care about naloxone. We just wanted to get high, and nothing else was on our minds. And so you can see 
yet the concern the, the, about what would happen from the, his opioid use was not even on his radar. He was essentially apathetic about the consequences of his use. This is in contrast to this other participant who felt that if I have a group of people at my house and we're all sitting around there hanging out and talking, I make sure it's right out in the open so that way everyone can see it. And she was unique. She and two other participants talked about this, I must have naloxone every time I use. So our fourth theme looked at changes in opioid use behaviors. So whether and how naloxone's changed opioid use. And um, some participants, again, we had a spectrum of responses here. Some thought it didn't change how they used it all. But others did talk about ways in which it, naloxone availability did change how they're using. So this first participant, she talked about how nobody wants to have to get Narcan. So it's not like, oh, I have Narcan. I can use as much as I want. Because you don't want to be Narcan. You just don't want to fall out, period. It is not a pleasant experience. And so for her, the goal of using was really to alleviate the withdrawal she experienced. She, didn't, she, she told me, you know, it doesn't make sense. Why would you use Narcan like that? Why would you use heroin? So you need Narcan. This is in, con in uh, contrast to this other participant who said, I knew that it was fentanyl, and I knew that there was the potential I could overdose. And I told him to get his Narcan ready because I knew what I was about to do, and I fell out just like that. And actually, he had two of them, two Narcan things that he had to administer. So just a note, fell out is a colloquial term for overdose. And he talked about this as just kind of, well, that's just what we did. That's just kind of what happened, is it was sort of a normative experience for him and his user group. Our fifth theme looked at naloxone behaviors and overdose mortality risk. So participants discussed several naloxone-related behaviors that could influence their risk for overdose. These included think an uncertainty about when to use naloxone, as well as um, reasons why they would or would not want to use naloxone. So I have a couple representative quotes for this as well. So lots of times, people mistake an overdose for a nod. And that's where a lot of people have ended up dying, because people thought they were just in a nod. But remember, I told you that my brother was like, oh, leave her alone. You're going to mess up her high. Just let her do a nod. And really, I was overdosed. I was like this, and I was overdosed, and I wasn't in a nod. So just another quick note, a nod is um, a symptom of overdose, where you're kind of snoring, kind of falling forward. The participant mimicked that when she was telling me about this. And this quote, to me, kind of brings up a lot of concerning issues because concern over what is a true overdose, how do users define what we might clinically say is a series of symptoms, they might not necessarily see that the same way. And in addition, um, you know, the concern over ruining someone's high, you don't want to administer Narcan because you don't want to ruin their high, you know, that, for those of us in public health, that's really concerning because this wonderful tool that we're using that can really help affect change with the overdose epidemic might be misconstrued. And, and that is really an important piece for, for my work. So this second quote, uh, the heroin addict's biggest fear is illness, is getting sick from withdrawal, so you don't want to do it to somebody else that you're hanging out with. But at the same time, all of this stuff is really embarrassing. But you strive for the point right before overdose, the point of highness right before overdose, so high that you're sloppy and falling over and all that stuff. So basically, for me to Narcan somebody, they've got to stop breathing. And so again, you have this concern over ruining someone's high, as well as the intention of using is to get right before an overdose. And to me, that's a very fine line. And that's a line that could change based on potency of the drug, based on other drugs they might have, or if they've been drinking. So that, that line could change. And that is particularly concerning as well. These results indicate that awareness is high for naloxone, but uptake is less so. And it could be that community education programs might not be the best distribution point for naloxone for users. Inpatient, outpatient treatment centers, methadone clinics, and needle exchanges might be better accessing those individuals who need naloxone and need it you know, at that kind of point of use. In addition, participants often talked about this opportunistic naloxone access. So, 
perceptions about when they need it, when they don't need it. Um, well, it'd be good to have, but I wouldn't necessarily take extra steps to have it. Uh, and that gets into kind of the social norms for naloxone. So if you could have it and you know, it was available, great. Maybe we need to make it more of a clean needle type situation for users. And then those hypernaloxone access, uh, those three women who talked about how they always have it every time they use. How could we leverage that for perhaps peer-to-peer -peer distribution? So uh, uh, peers, there's some, some programs in the literature where you train users to teach other users how to use naloxone. And could we potentially use that to help combat some of these, these concerns? So it's also from you know, this data, we're seeing that potentially motives for use could be influencing naloxone attitudes. So if the participant is using to mitigate withdrawal versus experimentation for a bigger high, that might influence whether they think naloxone is important, how important it might be, if it's something they want to make sure that they have access to. Finally, there are those disincentives for naloxone use. And I think this is one of the targets for public health education components uh, of the, the combating the overdose epidemic. The idea of ruining somebody's high and confusion over what is a true overdose could be contributing to the overdose mortality simply because they're not using Narcan when it's indicated for use. So this was an exploratory study. We set out to kind of see what's out there, see what's going on, and it was a small sample size. So I think larger epi-based studies could really help us answer some of the questions that have come up for us. Although with these quotes, you really get a richness in the data that I don't think we would have gotten had we done you know, a larger epi-based study. There were a lot of things that uh, my co-authors, one of my co-authors came into my office and was like, I, just, I cannot believe what I just read in, in this manuscript. And so I think it helps inform future work. In addition, this was an inpatient treatment sample. And so I think a wider array of participants, more diverse experiences would be helpful, particularly looking at outpatients and people not in treatment as well. So future directions, we know naloxone is widely acknowledged. How do we increase the access and use among opioid users, among those at risk for overdose? And understanding why there's such a variation, you know, what's holding people back from getting naloxone? What can we do to help close that gap? In addition, it's possible that naloxone is changing use behaviors for some, and what distinguishes those individuals who are making sure they always have naloxone access? And finally, our results indicate that naloxone may be increasing high risk use, again, for some participants. It's not a blanket statement, it's just these are some preliminary conclusions that we have drawn from this data. And this manuscript is under review currently. And I would like to thank the School of Nursing for having me today. It's been such an exciting part, uh, part of my week, as well as my dissertation committee, including Dr. Homish, uh, the chair, and then Dr. Chang, Dr. Collins, and Dr. Wysor. I'd like to thank the Stutzman Addiction Treatment Center. The staff there have been unbelievably welcoming. The patients have been so generous with their experiences and talking with me. And then my research assistants, Natalie and Katerina. Without them, this data would still be on audio recorders. And then my funding sources, the Mark Diamond Research Fund and the Community Health and Health Behavior Dissertation Fund. Thank you so much. And if we have time, I'd be happy to take questions. Or if we're holding those to the end, that's also, also fine.